This is CBC Here and Now. No crosswalk controversy here. Nope, St. John's is showing its pride. Luke was actually uh, roaming the streets of St. John's as a stray dog, and he was picked up and brought to the St. John's Humane Society. Staff Sergeant Don Bill attended the Humane Society and recruited Luke right on the spot. He has sniffed out millions of dollars in illegal drugs. And today, Luke, the police dog, is hanging up his leash. And in half an hour, it is a second look at our Last Scene series. A deep dive into multiple missing persons cases that happened right here at home. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Mariana Kellen. Let's get to our top story. Police suspect hydroplaning was a major factor in a head-on crash that killed two seniors near Clarenville. And they're warning drivers to slow down during heavy rainfall and watch for water buildup. It happened yesterday afternoon on Highway 230 near George's Brook and the Milton Turnoff. A 75-year-old man and 72-year-old woman were pronounced dead at the scene. Two others were injured and taken to hospital. A child was also taken to hospital, though police say there were no injuries. Police are not releasing the names of the people involved. Pride Week in St. John's will soon get underway. The week of activities starts Sunday at City Hall. And that's where Here and Now's Megan Kwan is live tonight. So, Megan, what can we expect? Well, it's quiet now, but the rainbow sidewalk behind me should give you a better idea of what to expect here on Sunday at the Pride flag raising and parade. Until then, groups around the city are gearing up for the colorful events in their own ways. Students at Memorial University are full of pride. Today, the students' union held a clothing swap where absolutely anyone could walk up and take or donate clothing. Everything from dresses to nylons to bras, all without judgment. And we're hoping to just be able to provide people with a safe space to come get some clothes. Um, you know, maybe they don't feel comfortable going out shopping, they can't afford to. Um, we're just helping them to provide them with what they would feel comfortable in. The group will also be marching in the St. John's Parade on Sunday, all in the name of support. Support that's been noticeably visible beyond St. John's in recent weeks, a first according to the city's Pride Board. And after months of controversy surrounding the inclusion of the RNC in the parade, this year's theme, Together, symbolizes an extended hand. We're trying to teach people empathy, we're trying to engage people in the understanding that some people have it worse off than others, and we can't do that without first coming together. Uniformed officers will be allowed to participate in this year's St. John's Pride events, a big difference compared to other Pride parades around the country where they've been banned. It's all in the hope of creating a city that everyone can be proud of. Pride means the ability to walk out around town without being yelled wonderful names at. It means the ability to walk around town with people I love and to see those people happy. Well, the kickoff is here at City Hall on Sunday, then a full week of events around the city. Reporting live, I'm Megan Kwan for Here and Now. Well, as you just saw Megan report there, big weekend, Pride weekend. What's it going to look like? Ooh, in St. John's, not so great. We're looking at a damp weekend for sure. But the real weather story uh, this weekend is the heat in Labrador. Just have a look at this. Uh, there's a heat warning in effect for the Happy Valley Goose Bay area, Upper Lake Melville and uh, Eagle River temperatures approaching 30 really over the weekend. So uh, the southwesterly flow will be keeping things very, very warm, not only in the daytime, but also in the nighttime. And this is the setup for uh, tomorrow. You can see Saturday morning, this heavy cloud cover over the Avalon Peninsula and these showers that are moving in towards Labrador West. So yeah, we're looking at some shower activity across the Avalon Peninsula by tomorrow afternoon. Temperature is not so great either looking at 17 degrees for the Avalon Peninsula and uh, for the rest of the island though not too bad looking at temperatures in the mid 20s or so 28 degrees uh, for eastern Labrador so yes it will be very hot and it's going to stay that way for the next few days and this setup is going to stick around as well for Sunday you can see those showers uh, coming through the Avalon Peninsula on Sunday so yeah during that pride parade that's what we're expecting 
And temperatures looking a bit better though, getting up to 20 degrees there uh, on the Avalon Peninsula on Sunday. And yes, staying quite warm in eastern Labrador as well. I'll get into uh, some more good news actually about how things are going to be changing next week a bit later. Ariana. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, schools in this province will soon be hiring a large group of teachers assistants. More than 300 assistants will be hired in the next three years. That includes 104 reading specialists and 200 teaching and learning assistants. Government shared the news today as it unveiled its education action plan in Grand Falls, Windsor. The hiring will start in September in 40 schools and government expects to pay about $3 million this year. I think when you look at it, it's really at what point do you want to pay? So we're willing to invest early so that we actually create benefits and opportunities for our students in the future. We know right now when it comes to math, reading, inclusive education, indigenous education, multiculturalism, and those sorts of things that, you know, we need to do better. This action plan that we're presenting here today, we will do better. Crews are demolishing the small strip mall in front of the old Sears building at the Avalon Mall in St. John's. It is the first step in a major renovation and expansion to the mall. It will include new stores and better parking, according to the mall owners. At the same time, the Kenmount Road exit from the mall is being realigned with Polina Road. The city says that work will create a better and safer intersection. That work is scheduled to be completed by the fall. A Dutch woman whose unruly behavior grounded an Air Canada flight in Happy Valley Goose Bay last weekend has been handed a jail sentence and a large fine. 21-year-old Elkie van de Vork pleaded guilty to one count of mischief and two counts under the Aeronautics Act. She also has to pay $3,400 to Air Canada. The flight was on its way from Toronto to Amsterdam early last Saturday when the plane was diverted to Happy Valley Goose Bay. The St. John's Regional Fire Department will soon have 16 new firefighters. The recruits were officially welcomed today at a ceremony at the Central Fire Station. Chief Sherry Colford says the group has varying backgrounds, bringing a diverse range of experience to the department. They'll be assigned to one of eight local fire stations where they'll learn from senior firefighters and officers. Well, speaking of recruits, a very valued member of the RCMP retired today. Friends and colleagues came together to say goodbye, but this member of the force is different from most. Here now's Peter Cowan explains. Today is Luke's very last day on the job as a drug sniffing dog, and he came to the force in a rather unusual way. He was in the pound. He was only a couple of days away from being euthanized. He was a stray. Um, we assume living on the streets because no one did come in to claim him. Uh, so he was at the shelter for a while and we had some RCMP officers who would come in on a regular basis and kind of look at the, the dogs that we had. And uh, Luke was a winner for them. And he's been a good boy ever since. He went off to school. He completed the 11 week drug sniffing course in just three weeks. He sniffed out more than $5 million in drugs and money over his career. He once even detected cocaine inside a trunk, wrapped in baggies, covered in Vaseline, and drenched in paprika. But the end of his seven-year police career is thanks to the legalization of marijuana. They can't have him pointing out pot anymore. It's going to be a legal substance. We don't want dogs out there hitting on something that's legal. What's he going to be doing in retirement? Well. There's a long list of people who wanted to adopt Luke, but another RCMP member here in St. John's is going to take him in, and he's now going to be a pet. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. I think if my memory serves me right, I was the first female African student here. One of Memorial University's first international students returns for a visit. Eva Richards tells us some of her memories as she takes in all that has changed.
Welcome back, everyone. And it's time to meet a couple of young athletes of the day. This is Ben Bailey, who's seven years old, plays in the novice division with CB's minor hockey. He loves all sports, but hockey is his favorite. Congratulations, Ben. And our next young athlete of the day is hockey player Parker Legg. Parker is six years old, and he lives in Holyrood. And that's where he plays for the CBR Renegades. Congratulations, Parker. Our update is brought to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can too. A lot of uh, talk earlier in the week about Chris. Mm -hmm. He's gone, but left a lot of rain for some parts of the island in particular. Oh, a lot of rain. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that in just a second, but I think first we have like a caribou mm -hmm. uh, video okay. to see. Just have a look at this. Amazing video. Excuse me, I'd like to get through here. <laughs> um, I, I, I see oh, you're blocking the road a bit. They're taking uh, their time. Oh, here anybody, comes another one. If anybody would like to move here, that would be quite nice. I don't uh, think they follow road rules. <laughs> Beautiful color. These young caribou were spotted near Cape Race. In the southeastern tip of the Avalon Peninsula where there used to be huge to be. herds <laughs> roaming, it, but uh, it's a real treat, real treat to see them. Yeah, great video. <laughs> Thanks for sending it in. Thanks for reminding me about ah. that video. <laughs> well, you know, everyone was talking about Chris yesterday and we're gonna move on from it in just a moment, but first I thought it would be cool to look at some of the totals. Just have a look at uh, some of the rain that post-tropical storm Chris brought to the province. Yes, in uh, Gander saw the most rain, almost 77 millimeters just over 60 millimeters in Bonavista, and that's also where the top winds were, gusts up to 109. Terra Nova saw just over 70 millimeters of rain on the Buren, 41.7 uh, millimeters, and St. Albans saw 70 millimeters of rain. So yeah, very, very wet night, very windy uh, in the St. John's area for sure. So this is the situation right now. You can see this uh, system that's moving up from the south. This is gonna bring a lot of scattered showers to the eastern portion of the island this weekend. And as well, you can see this other system here pushing towards western Labrador, also going to bring some showers there. So, but for tonight, things are looking pretty good. You can see how clear it is uh, in Labrador, and we have just a little bit of a cloud cover over the island. So tonight, temperatures uh, in the low double digits, just a bit of cloud cover, uh, some fairly light winds as well on the island. Quite warm, though, in uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, an overnight low of just of 16 degrees tonight. So, yeah, quite warm, and it's going to stay very warm there. I'll get to that in just a second. But most of the rain is going to hit the Avalon Peninsula, so I thought I'd have a closer look at that. So this is Saturday morning, and you can see by Saturday afternoon, those showers are coming through pretty persistent into the evening hours. So if you are in St. John's, you're going to wake up tomorrow to about 12 degrees, mainly cloudy skies, and then we're going to see those showers move in in the afternoon, get up to about 17 degrees, and then in the evening hours, cooling down a bit, but that rain uh, continuing. For the rest of the island and for Labrador tomorrow, though, looking pretty good. You can see pretty clear skies over most of the island and as well for Labrador. Western Labrador, though, looking at some uh, showers coming through. Uh, so this is the picture for the rest of the island. You can see some lovely temperatures in central areas. Gander, 22 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. Cooler along the coast, though, but as you move inland, temperatures will get a nice boost. Now for uh, Western Labrador, you are looking at those showers coming through in the afternoon, 20 degrees, but look at Happy Valley Goose Bay, 28 degrees as the high tomorrow, a very hot, uh, dry day coming, and that's why this heat warning is in effect. This will probably be sticking around now for the next few days, so expect it to be quite warm uh, in that portion of Labrador over the next few days. So as we get into Sunday, you can see a very similar setup that we saw on Saturday, those showers persisting in the east, pushing a little bit more to the west. So cloudy with showers uh, for St. John's and the east, some uh, clouds with showers as well for central. And there is that chance of showers for western uh, portion of the island as well. Still, you can see quite warm in eastern 
Labrador. So as we get into Monday, yes, that system is still bringing more showers to the islands. So chance of showers in the east and in central Temperatures getting a bit of a boost. You can see Eastern Labrador still very, very warm as you get into Monday. So this is the picture for the next uh, five days. We're looking at a great start uh, midweek uh, for the St. John's area and uh, for the eastern portion of Newfoundland. For central areas, we are looking at 29 degrees on Tuesday and some cloud cover on Wednesday. Western Newfoundland, 27 with some sunshine as well. So yeah, it's shaping up to be a little bit wet in eastern Labrador and as well as in western Labrador. And that's your forecast. Back to you, Debbie. Thank you, Carolyn. Memorial University had a special visitor this week, one of the first international students who studied at the university more than 50 years ago. Eva Frances Richards came to St. John's from the African country of Sierra Leone on a scholarship from the Canadian government to study economics. Here now is Stephen Miller met Richards on her tour. After more than half a century away, Eva Richards returned to Memorial with her three adult children to answer what she calls a yearning urge to return. Richards first came here, all on her own, in 1963 from Sierra Leone, Africa, to complete a master's in economics. Back then, one was not the international school it is now. I think if my memory serves me right, I was the first female African student here. There were two male um, African students. A lot has changed at Memorial University St. John's campus since the 1960s. The school has grown in both size and student body. It's also a well-known school for international students. A path Richards and a few others paved all those years ago. During this visit, Memorial arranged for her to receive her golden alumni pin and to tour the campus so she could revisit old haunts and see what's changed here. She was speaking about her memories and they are like sharp as that. Uh, so much uh, recalled, so much saved, and so much special. After studying at Mon, Richards returned to Sierra Leone, where she started a family and joined the country's civil service. But she took with her many personal memories of her time at Memorial, including one from November 1963 that stands out, witnessing an historical event on television. I remember I was coming back to Boita House from lectures, and there was this, I wouldn't say pandemonium, but there was such excitement in the air, you know, and I asked, what's happening? Something must have happened. And I said, President Kennedy has been assassinated. While sitting in the same dorm room she called home so many years ago, Richard summed up what it was like to be back after all these years. Emotionally, extremely satisfying because it's been quite an ambi ambition of mine to come back. Richard seems to have inspired her three children as well. They turned out to be globetrotters. Two now live in the U.S., the other in the U.K. Stephen Miller, CBC News, St. John's. Just ahead, it's our birthdays and anniversaries, a little earlier than normal on Fridays this summer.
Welcome back once again. In national and international news now, tobacco giant Philip Morris has lost its battle before the Supreme Court of Canada for access to the health care records of smokers. The High Court today sided with the government of B.C., ruling unanimously that patient privacy must be upheld. Philip Morris, owner of Rothman's, Benson and Hedges, argued the records are crucial to its defense in a still-developing multi-billion dollar damages case. That case involves BC's 17-year push to recoup the costs of treating smoking-related diseases directly from big tobacco. Today's decision paves the way for the next round of legal battles. BC and every other province has uh, launched a similar cost recovery lawsuits against the tobacco industry. The lawsuits are collectively seeking about $120 billion. Donald Trump did not set foot in London today. He says he doesn't feel welcome, and that's exactly the message protesters wanted to deliver. <laughs> Tens of thousands marched through the heart of the British capital, waving banners and blasting the U.S. president. Demonstrators denounced him as a sexist and racist, and some even called for his impeachment. There was even a giant balloon depicting Trump as a screaming orange baby. An infant wearing a diaper and holding a cell phone. Trump never saw the protest. He left for Scotland, where he plans to get in some golf. Well, the already bloody election campaign in Pakistan has turned even deadlier. Suicide bombers hit two separate rallies today, killing dozens of people. <laughs> the worst attack happened near Quetta. That blast left at least 70 people dead, including a local candidate. It is the deadliest attack by Pakistani militants this year. Voters head to the polls July 25th. An effort to save endangered rhinos in Kenya has ended in what's being called a complete disaster. 14 black rhinos were relocated and more than half of them have died. There were fewer than 5,500 of these rare animals in the world and they are all in Africa. The plan was to first tranquilize them and then move the rhinos to a reserve in southern Kenya. That part went smoothly, but it seems the rhinos couldn't adapt to the saltier water in their new home, and eight of them have died. Well, on a happier note, let's find out who's celebrating this week. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Patrick Budd and Christine Coombs of Heart's Desire. Happy 69th wedding anniversary to Gordon and Mary Hodder of Lewisport on the 9th. By the way, Gordon celebrated his 90th birthday yesterday and Mary's 92nd birthday is tomorrow. Happy 91st birthday to Eileen Wells. She's currently in Gander but is originally from Glovertown. Happy 94th birthday to Clifford Barter of Bay de Verde who celebrated on the 11th. Happy 62nd anniversary to Enid and Maxwell Barrett of Manuals, that was on the 9th. Happy 70th anniversary to Lehman and Irene Gale of Robinsons. It was a golden anniversary yesterday for Robert and Lydia Jeans of Change Islands. Happy 51st anniversary to Albert and Gertie Boone of Bishop's Falls, that's coming up on Sunday. Congratulations to Bob and Margaret Barrett of Old Perligan, who celebrated their 66th wedding anniversary on Monday the 9th. Happy 50th anniversary greetings to Ray and Tish Collins of Placentia, who are celebrating this coming Sunday. Best wishes to Pearl and Carl Milley of St. Anthony, who were married 63 years on the 9th. Happy 53rd anniversary to Jim and Marie Suley of Heart's Delight, Trinity Bay, whose special day was this past Tuesday. Joan and Luke House of Kippens celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary on the 11th. Congratulations. Congratulations to Bill and Geraldine Budd of Grand Falls, Windsor on their 52nd wedding anniversary coming up this Sunday. 50th anniversary greetings to Rosalind and Gordon Kelly of Glovertown. Best wishes to Clayton and Millicent Dyke of Port Union who celebrated 50 years of marriage yesterday. 
Happy 95th birthday to Nita Roberts of Cormac, who celebrated on July 10th. Happy 92nd birthday this coming Sunday to Ivy Harvey of Carmenville. She's now in Gander. Happy birthday, Barbara Warren of Milton, who celebrated her 92nd birthday on July 9th. Happy 94th birthday to Myrtle Bonvi of St. John's, who celebrated on July 11th. Greetings from all of her family. Best wishes to Nida Chipman of Spaniards Bay, who turned 97 years old on the 12th. Happy 60th anniversary to Jean and Jim Jewer of Cornerbrook. A big birthday to celebrate now. Trixie Hines of Stephenville was 103 years old on the 12th. She's in great health and lives in her own home. Happy birthday to Clarence Freak of Springdale, who celebrated his 94th birthday yesterday. Happy 94th birthday as well to Nina Giles of Smith's Harbor, who celebrated on July 5th. Happy 90th birthday yesterday to Mary Sturge of St. John's. Another happy 90th birthday greeting to Ethel Thompson of Grand Bank. Congratulations to John and Mary Lewis of Colliers, who will celebrate their 62nd anniversary tomorrow. Garth and Annette Evley of St. John's are celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary tomorrow. Congratulations. Happy 51st anniversary to Bert and Edie Slade of Arnold's Cove. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Herb and Georgina Parsons of Grand Bank, whose special day is today. Another golden couple, happy anniversary to Barbara and Walter Dominey, who are celebrating today. Happy 56th anniversary coming up on the 18th to Max and Betty Mercer of Shearstown. And wishing Violet and Gordon Monk of St. John's a happy 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, everyone. Well, that is it for uh, the regular part of Here Now. Carolyn and I are saying good night. But stick with us because next we're going to bring you a series last seen, a revisit of some missing persons cases in the province. Night.
Not everything is as it seems, and that's certainly the case when it comes to the disappearance of Danny Pickett. He was 25, a fisherman who just wanted a night out on George Street. But where he went after bar hopping 11 years ago is a puzzle police can't solve. It's a case involving divers, missing clothing, and a psychic. Tonight, we bring you this episode of Last Seen that first aired last March. St. John's Harbor, the backdrop to a devastating mystery. I think that somebody somewhere has knowledge about this and what happened. It's clearly a mystery in terms of where Daniel Pickett went uh, on this particular evening. You can accept it, but I mean, it's still, when you stop and think about it, 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 it kind of like crawls up your spine. October 24th, 2006. A Tuesday night, 25-year-old Danny Pickett and a fellow crew member from the Newfoundland tradition set out for a night on the town. The last night before Danny headed home to Clarenville. At least that was the plan. At approximately 11 o'clock p.m., Daniel left the club to visit uh, another club and uh, he hasn't been heard of or seen since that point in time. According to the RNC, Danny had been at the Cotton Club earlier in the night, but met up with his crewmate at nearby Turkey Joe's. He'd planned on returning to the strip club, then eventually back to the Newfoundland tradition to sleep. But how far Danny Pickett got has everyone stumped. What his family knows for sure is that he was alive and well at 10.45 that night. He called his twin brother Dennis from Club One. He was very nervous at the bar. He felt, I, I'm not sure what he was nervous about. And he told my brother that he would see him the next day. And he told my brother to tell mom daddy loves him, which he normally said in a phone conversation. He specifically said that either someone was making him paranoid or he was making someone paranoid. Danny Pickett never made it to his one o'clock ride to Clarenville the next day. In the weeks after his disappearance, police searched alleyways and side streets. Divers took to the water near the Newfoundland tradition. Maybe he lost his footing, fell in the water, swept to sea by strong currents. A tragic accident. If it was, his siblings don't think police acted soon enough. I think divers should have been put in the water within the first 24 to 48 hours as soon as it was time, not a week later. Shouldn't have took two weeks for him to go to the bars that he was at, asking questions and flashing his picture because no bartender is going to remember a face after two weeks. It was, it was just pointless, just pointless. Police know very little about what happened. Earlier in the day, Danny Pickett took out $200 cash from an ATM. Later in the evening, another 40 was withdrawn. After that, nothing. No bank activity, no movement, no sightings. It's as if Danny Pickett just vanished. Police spoke with witnesses, friends and crew members. There's one person they'd like to speak with, an unidentified female, a woman who friends say Danny was planning on meeting that night. There's no description provided to the friends. There was no name, no address. Uh, in fact, the friend who he was with on George Street did not see this female. Uh, he only became aware of this information through communication with Daniel. And what about the phone call about Danny being nervous at the bar? Warren says they looked into that. We did review it. There was no real credibility established uh, to that particular point, uh, and we have no factual information to suggest that uh, an altercation took place that evening uh, between Daniel Pickett and another male. So did Danny Pickett ever make it back to the Newfoundland tradition? When the boat was checked, his watch and his wallet was aboard the boat, uh, according to the first mate. I mean, no one goes downtown without their watch or, well, without their wallet anyhow. So I find that really suspicious. And then when a family member went to collect his items, the watch was gone. 
His family suspects something sinister. I definitely think he made it back to the boat. Yeah. I mean, he grew up around a fish plant all his life. So, I mean, like, actually getting onto the boat and slipping, that's very unlikely. Fall turned to winter, winter to spring. Five months passed, nothing. That is, until the snow began to melt, revealing the first piece of evidence found in the case. A jacket and hat matching the description of the clothing worn by Danny Pickett that night. The jacket, uh, is similar in terms of color, striping, make of the jacket, as well as the size, according to the family. The hat as well, the color, uh, the white bib, uh, the mark tech, and uh, name on the hat uh, is similar uh, to Daniel Pickett's. There was no evidentiary value uh, other than the fact that they're similar in nature to Daniel Pickett's. Uh, but there's no signs of a struggle, uh, there's no signs of any bloodletting on, on either the jacket or the hat. It was found behind Campbell Ship Supplies on Water Street West, about two kilometers from George Street. On the route, Danny Pickett would have taken if he planned on walking back to the ship. But family members say it wasn't any ordinary member of the public who found it, but by psychic Shelley Stokes. Without some evidentiary proof someone did something to Danny Pickett, it can't be tested for DNA. Instead, it stays closed up in this box. Potential evidence for a potential criminal case. For now, Danny Pickett is just missing. You never know what happened. I mean, he could have, he could have made it to the boat, and he could have slipped in the water. I mean, he could have hit his head. He could have, could have had amnesia. He could be in Mexico for all we know. You, you never know. It's just something that you don't know. You don't. There's. I have thought about every possibility in this world, gone and here, and you just you'll never have answers. There I mean, is no answers. I mean, you you can accept it, but I mean, it's still when you stop and think about it, it it, it kind of like crawls up your spine and just stays here. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's a scary talk.
welcome back. University student Josh Miller was 20 years old when he seemingly vanished into thin air. It's been five years now since he's been seen, but the question remains, where exactly was he last? Josh Miller made it to the east end of St. John's. Police say that part is certain. What's also certain is that the door of his friend's house was locked that night and 20 year old Miller never made it inside. In St. John's tonight, the search for 20 year old Joshua Miller continues. Josh, uh, everybody's missing you. You got your family and your friends worried. Even though being the life of the party, he was always one of the more responsible ones. Given the attire he was wearing at the time of his disappearance, we are concerned for his safety. Josh Miller was a university student with dreams of becoming a police officer. He was a hard worker and held two jobs, one at a hardware store, the other as a bouncer. At the end of the day, he, he wanted to be in law enforcement. That was his goal. Josh Miller was a person who had plans for a future. Having gone out the night before, Josh wanted to relive his fun night. His good friend, Fergus Dumphy, stayed home that night. Josh left his beloved Dodge Charger at Dumphy's home in the center of the city before heading downtown. He usually crashed here a lot of the time, so I just told him, you know, just keep in touch, let me know if you need me to pick you up or anything like that, and we'll, uh, we'll just uh, get you to come back here at the end of the night. And then, you know, we talked. Like, I, I wish I still had the text, so we could show you the text, but basically I was just, you know, it was the same banter we always had, like, but uh, around like close to 12 o'clock, probably 11.30 or something, he stopped answering me. That's when I kind of thought something was weird. There was an altercation inside of one of the clubs that carried out to George Street, and evening he went missing. Josh was brought to the cab by friends who he was socializing with. That citywide taxi drove eight kilometers to a new subdivision off Stavanger Drive. Police say Josh was going to a friend's house. That friend was supposed to meet him back there. We think that, you know, he got out of that cab. There was no issues between him and the cab driver. Josh got out wearing just a black t-shirt and jeans. Later that morning, he missed his shift at Rona, just a short distance away from where he was dropped off. Out of character, something was wrong. There was a couple of flags. One was the fact that he didn't pick his car. The other is that he didn't answer me. Searchers look in sheds and under patios as temperatures dropped into the minus 20s. Then a snowstorm blew through the area. But where Josh Miller was last seen isn't that simple. In fact, there are three places he was reportedly spotted, and it all depends on which version of events you choose to believe. And two of those tips brought us to the search, the area of Cumberland Crescent uh, off of Mount Sawyer Road. One tip placed Josh uh, at the Avalon Mall on the day after he went missing. And another tip actually came from uh, the roommates of his girlfriend at the time, who believed they saw Josh on the exterior of the property uh, at that location. When the snow melted that spring, police searched that area too. Nothing. Two years later, a new tip. A man driving home that night believed he saw Josh Miller walk over a snowbank and into a wooded area near RCAF Road, not too far from where he was dropped off. So, is it possible he was in all three places that night? It's possible. It's possible. But then the question comes, to go from Stavanger to Torbay Road, uh, that's walking distance, and you can cover that area very, very quickly. Uh, to go from Torbay Road to Cumberland Crescent, you need some type of transportation. And we exhausted uh, all forms of transportation for that night. 
Ironically, the only piece of evidence left behind may have saved him, his iPhone dropped in the back of a cab. As for the phone, no, uh, we were unsuccessful in our uh, attempt to recover any data from the cell phone. Call records didn't leave clues, and photos, videos, text messages, and emails were inadvertently erased. What happened to Josh Miller? Inspector Warren is satisfied the cab driver was truthful and had nothing to do with the disappearance. And that man who Josh Miller fought on George Street? Well, he's been interviewed by police twice and has been cleared. Fergus Dunphy has heard his friends skipped out on his cab fare and ran out. To this day, he has no idea why Josh Miller went to Blue Putty Drive. If he had a friend there, it was a surprise to his best friend. And if he needed money, why not come back to Fergus Dunphy's, a five-minute cab ride? After all, he'd need to get his car there the next morning. In my mind, like, there's no doubt that someone killed him. There's no doubt. Like, you don't just go missing in small town St. John's without any trace of you, without someone being involved, okay? You think about it pretty regular uh, in terms of where could the body be? Is there anything else possible that we could do to assist in locating the body and put in some type of closure to the family? How do I reconcile it? Um, I mean, how do you, right? Everybody loved him, so... I mean, the good news is that, like, up until then, he did have a great life. Now we go back to a story from 1984. This is the story of a young woman who vanished from downtown St. John's, whose disappearance has passed through the hands of investigators for decades without any new leads. But that hasn't stopped her family from hoping someone's conscience will catch up to them. A mild Monday night, Pamela Asprey is just shy of 20 years old. Her Mona Lisa smile has a twinkle. Her frame is tiny, but those who knew her say she was fearless. On this night, Pamela told her friends she'd be back to the bar in 20 minutes. 20 minutes turned to hours, then days, now decades. Pamela did enter the vehicle 
uh, sometime after 9 o'clock p.m. on November 12, uh, 1984, and Pamela has not been seen or heard of since that particular time. Well, truthfully, I think she's dead. Really? What do you think happened? I know I say someone, some maniac or something got her. The hope is there, like, there's something that maybe, maybe she's alive. The story of Pamela Asprey begins in Happy Valley Goose Bay. The third of six kids, Pamela left home after her father died in 1981. For years, she hitchhiked her way between Newfoundland, the Maritimes, and Winnipeg. Unafraid, untouchable. No matter what trouble she was in, she came to me. She hitchhiked from Goose Bay I don't know how many times. <laughs> Pamela Asprey eventually did return to St. John's, the city where she was last seen. If she was alive, she would be back to me now. That's, that's the only thing that tells me that something's happened to her. Her roommate advised that Pamela left to walk to the downtown core of St. John's. This lady, as well as other persons that we've interviewed, made us aware that her mode of transportation was primarily hitchhiking. So she would hitchhike from her residence in East End uh, to downtown. In fact, uh, we've identified one of the persons who picked her up that evening, just a short distance from her residence, and dropped her off in the area of uh, Martin's Lounge, uh, downtown St. John's. Martin's Lounge, Water Street. Today, it's Aaron's Pub, Pamela had a few drinks, then told her friends she'd be right back. Perhaps she was so certain of that, Pamela left this behind, a day planner, a calendar, a debit card. She left Martin's Lounge and walked to the War Memorial on Duckworth Street. Pamela told her friends she was meeting a man, a man unknown to her. He was likely a John. Pamela Asprey was a sex worker. A blue vehicle pulled up. Pamela got inside and it drove off. Well, she didn't show up Monday night, she didn't show up Tuesday night, and Wednesday morning, I think 8 o'clock, I called her, please. It wasn't until weeks later that Pamela's disappearance was public. A small paragraph in the evening telegram, sandwiched between letters to Santa and Christmas sales. The girl could have left the province, of course, without telling anybody that she was, that she was leaving. She left herself open for various types of activities. And uh, a girl of that nature uh, always causes some concern. And uh, of course, in the back of our minds, there, there may be foul play suspected. Her disappearance came after a string of Christmas time tragedies in St. John's. First, 17 year old Sharon Drover went missing in 1978. Two years later, schoolgirl Dana Bradley was found dead. Inuit student Henrietta Millick vanished the following year. Pamela Asprey was next, but police say there is no evidence today to suggest they're connected. Throughout the years, this file has passed through many investigators. Now it's in Inspector Tom Warren's hands. Since this file has been assigned to me, we've continued to investigate uh, who owned that particular vehicle, looking at people that would have hung out in that area on the night in question. That particular aspect of this investigation is still very active. It's possible the man in that car killed her, but is it possible to find him 34 years later? It's also possible she was just dropped off. Lots of possibilities. In Pine Glen, New Brunswick, those possibilities are too painful for Alice Lafergie. No matter what she did, that was fine. I loved her. 
and my love for her was unconditional. My looking for her is unconditional, and I don't think it'll stop until the day I die. Every November, Lafergie writes a Facebook post about her missing niece. Maybe someone will see it. Maybe someone knows who did it. Whoever killed her, I would like them to know that they took someone of value. She wasn't garbage. She was a valuable person. In my life and in brothers' and sisters' lives, may God have mercy on their soul. I forgive them. That's hard, but I do. That's it for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Next Friday, we'll re-air three more episodes of Last Seen. We'll probe the disappearance of Ontario woman Jessica Hepner, who's been missing since 2015, plus the mystery of what happened to Henrietta Millick in 1982. And we'll dive into what police have gathered in the investigation into Aaron Dragonetti's curious arrival and subsequent disappearance in St. John's. Good night and have a great weekend.